Monday, April 8. This is the news on PBCJ. I am Simone Absalom. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton said the ministry is working towards improving the framework for eye health care. In one instance, a technical working group is developing the government's proposed national eye health plan. Dr. Tufton was speaking at a ceremony at the Kingston Public Hospital on Friday to mark this year's visit by the People's Republic of China's Bright Journey Eye Care Medical Mission. The group was established in 2017 by Dr. Tufton to provide policy and strategic direction for the prevention of blindness and visual impairment in keeping with the World Health Organization's Universal Eye Health Global Action Plan. The technical working group has been doing some work. In fact, I met with them, uh, I think, a few weeks ago and are working towards drafting a national eye health plan which will provide the, not just the strategic direction, but outline a number of initiatives which over time we will develop towards making the process more efficient and, and more effective. And in the area of management at that administration? We're looking at clinical audits to look at the institutionalization of measures within our hospital system, certification, clinical audits and other measures to deal with improving the process going forward. He highlighted the protracted delays experienced by many people needing urgent eye care. We have too long a wait for persons who need eye care. And if we agree that 80% of persons who lose their sight, globally that is, uh, is, is at risk primarily because of lack of prevention, screening and treatment, we have to find a way to shorten that weight by building out our capacity to screen and to treat as required. For his part, China's ambassador to Jamaica, Tian Chi, said assistance extended under the mission will serve to brighten the lives of the beneficiaries and strengthen the partnership between Jamaica and China. This uh, mission is not only a medical event, but uh, uh, it's an event with uh, great significance. You know the uh, Chinese medical team not only I mean, uh, brightened the, uh, the, the, the sights of Jamaican patients, but also I mean, uh, bring the Chinese governments and people's goodwill to the Jamaican government and the people. I hope that uh, with this mission, so the cooperation in the health area between the two countries will be, I mean, uh, on a high, higher level. The initiative will this year facilitate cataract surgeries for some 500 Jamaicans and provide U.S. $500,000 worth of additional equipment and supplies to the KPH. This is the mission's second visit to Jamaica following representatives arrival in May 2015 when 200 surgeries were performed. Spanish Town Hospital's neonatal intensive care unit last Wednesday received a donation of specialized medical equipment valued at $25 million. From part proceeds of the 2018 Sagicor Sigma corporate run, another $5 million was also allocated to maintain the equipment. Dr. Jacqueline Wright James, acting senior medical officer of the hospital, on receiving the donation, praised the initiative for being sensitive to the hospital's needs. Five of the 116 people who have tested positive for influenza A, H1N1, in less than four months have died. But only 35% of the vaccines dispatched locally to fight the deadly flu, thousands might be discarded this year, as Jamaicans have been reluctant to get vaccinated. According to data from the Ministry of Health, 18,500 doses of flu vaccine have been dispatched locally since October 2018. But up to Tuesday of last week, only 3,771 doses had been administered in the public sector and 2,636 at private medical facilities. According to the Caribbean Public Health Agency, the flu season in Jamaica runs from September to March. As the warmer months approach and the incidence of flu subsides, thousands of vaccines not used by October when they expire 
will have to be dumped. Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade Minister Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith says the upcoming 8th Biennial Jamaica Diaspora Conference is expected to generate tangible outcomes which are implementable. This assurance against the background of what she notes is concern from some stakeholders who describe the conference as a talk shop. I want to also assure you that we will be placing the conference report on the website. Conference report was circulated last year, but I understand everyone has not seen it who is interested in seeing it. So I've asked the team to ensure that it's placed on the website to ensure that there can be most, most uh, or rather more focused feedback and discussion in a space that we will carve out at the conference. It is our intention that one of the principal tangible outcomes of this conference will be the finalization of the diaspora conference, sorry, of the national diaspora policy so that it may be presented to the cabinet and the parliament for its acceptance and implementation. The event is slated for June 16 to June 20 at the Jamaica Conference Center downtown Kingston under the theme Jamaica and the Diaspora, Building Pathways for Sustainable Development. Johnson Smith also informed that there will be a conference launch in New York tomorrow at the office of the Consulate General of Jamaica beginning at 6 p.m. Additionally, she said focus group meeting on the draft national diaspora policy will be held with a broad cross-section of Jamaicans living in New York. The draft policy is of course now on the ministry's website. It's on the landing page and I invite all of you, invite all of you to read it, to gain a fresh insight into the guiding principles and the thematic areas. Similar launches are slated for Miami and Toronto. The Cabinet of Jamaica has approved a contract valued at US $31 million to the consortium led by local company Productive Business Solutions. The contract is for the provision of data center hardware, software, public key infrastructures and the national identification system solution to be implemented over five years. The procurement process commenced on April 25, 2017. During the process, 76 suppliers downloaded the request for proposals. Subsequently, five consortiums submitted bids. Funding from the Inter-American Development Bank has been used to finance NIDS. The IDB has also provided technical advice and fiduciary oversight of the project. The implementation of the NIDS is slated to begin in 2020 in two phases, a pilot phase and the national rollout phase. The main campus of the University of Technology was transformed into an international animation festival village over the weekend, marking the third edition of the conference that the International Animation Conference and Film Festival Kingston Animation 2019. Hosted by the Government of Jamaica under the Youth Employment in the Digital and Animation Enterprises, the event was organized in collaboration with the World Bank. Coordinators say entries to the show increased significantly since its inception from approximately 300 in 2013 to over 900 in 2016 and has exceeded 1,800 from 105 countries this year. Anne-Marie Vaz is expected to be sworn in this week as Member of Parliament for Portland Eastern following her victory in Thursday's by-election. The final count by the Electoral Office of Jamaica that was completed on Saturday has given Vaz a slightly higher margin of victory. The final count showed both Vaz and the People's National Party's Damien Crawford increased their tally of votes when compared to the preliminary count. It showed that Vaz received 9,989 votes, 319 more than the 9,670 votes polled by Crawford. At the end of the preliminary count on Thursday, Vaz had 9,917 votes to 9,611 for Crawford, a 306 vote margin of victory. The EOJ says 75 ballots were rejected. 
The latest police crime statistics released on Sunday have revealed that 359 people have been murdered since the start of the year. The data released by the Periodic Serious and Violent Crime Review Unit of the Jamaica Constabulary Force show that 132 people were murdered last month, the highest so far this year. The figures show a major spike in murders in St. James following the lifting of the state of public emergency in that western Jamaica parish. 200 illegal guns and nearly 3,000 rounds of ammunition have been seized since January. In regional news, lawmakers in the Cayman Islands voted unanimously last Thursday for a motion to support the government's move to appeal a ruling legalizing same-sex marriages. We have more in this Cayman 27 news report. Calling it a matter of definite national importance, East End MLA Arden McLean presented his motion supporting government's appeal of Chief Justice Anthony Smelly's decision to the fullest extent. The motion kicked off hours of debate. We are not dealing with Sunday school children or people. These people don't mean us well. Take warning. Savannah MLA Anthony Eden seconded the motion comparing Friday, March 29th, the day the judgment was handed down, to the Pearl Harbor attack. What is the difference between the Cayman Islands and Solomon Gomorrah? You think he's going to make an exception? He's not going to do it. Are we going to sit down as Caymanians and allow this to invade our country? God forbid. Education Minister Juliana O'Connor Connolly told the chamber she received what was purportedly Chantel Day and Vicki Baden Bush's marriage license, encouraging opponents of same-sex marriage to lodge objection to the union in writing or in person. The person who is marrying you usually will pause to say, Do, does anybody have any objections or does anyone have to, anything to say? So if you miss the seven-day window, please attend the marriage because it's been a very public display. And you have an opportunity to object. Petitioner Chantel Day responded to Ms. O'Connor Connolly in a statement saying, This call for objections to our marriage in writing slash in person demonstrates a blatant disregard for the rule of law and raises concerns of abuse of her position of power as a leader in our community. And this is no longer a gay marriage issue. This is a constitutional issue. Others like Newland's MLA Alva Saku questioned the Chief Justice's authority to usurp the lawmaker's legislative power. What comes next? What else will be taken away from this legislature? President of Cuba's Councils of State and Ministers, Miguel Diaz Canel Bermudez, Thursday afternoon received the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Ado Dankwa Akufo Ado on an official visit to that country. During the amicable meeting, the two leaders addressed the positive state of the historic bilateral relations their countries share and reaffirmed the will to promote political ties and collaboration. They also discussed other topics on the region and international agenda. In sports, we kick off with football as the Rega girls were held at a 1-1 draw by South Africa's women team known as Banyana Banyana in their friendly international at the Moses Mahiba Stadium in Durban, South Africa on the weekend. Both nations have made landmark qualifications to this summer's FIFA Women's World Cup slated for France. In the case of Jamaica, they became the first from the Caribbean to do so, while South Africa secured their first berth after years of trying. The girls have been drawn in Group C to face Brazil, Italy and Australia in that order. In cricket, Englishman Richard Pybus could be removed as head coach of West Indies just three months after overseeing the Test Series victory against England. His contract was meant to run until after India's visit to the Caribbean in July following the World Cup, but newly elected Cricket West Indies president Ricky Skerritt will host a board meeting next week as part of a review of the coaching structure. And that's the news on PBCJ. Thanks so much for watching.